understanding the crisis confronting South Africa. As a missionary who for the last, hundred, uh, for the last 37 years I've been ministering in 38 countries, as far north as Sudan and as far west as Nigeria, and I must say, looking at what's going on in South Africa, I feel like I've read this book and I know how this story progresses. I know the Congo, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola. We've seen the way these Marxists work. And we need to understand the crisis that confronts us. In 1 Chronicles 12, let's try this again. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we read about the men of Ishasar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. We need to understand the times and we need to know what God's people should do. Our farms and our freedoms are under fire. The National Assembly of the South African Parliament sent shockwaves around the country by setting in motion a process to change the constitution so as to allow expropriation of property without compensation. Section 25 doesn't just deal with farms or land, it deals with all property. That would even include intellectual property, anything. Now, it's interesting to note that the ANC has been moving this direction for quite a while. The threat to private ownership property and the clearly stated intention to remove the constitutional safeguards, Section 25 in particular, and protections for private ownership property has staggered observers. The motion was adopted by a vote of 241 members of parliament in favour and only 83 against. The African National Congress and the Economic Freedom Fighters, EFF, otherwise known as the Everything for Free Party, they voted for the motion, whereas the Democrat Alliance, the Freedom Front, the Congress of the People, COPE, ACDP, they voted against. Now, the EFF are mostly young people, mostly unemployed people, mostly uh, single people. 74% are singles. Very few of them actually have children. At the one time African National Congress youth leader, um, oh, not youth leader, sorry, the one time ANC leader, uh, used to be called Terra Lakota, Masut uh, Lakota, now leader of COPE, condemned the EFF's tactics as imbecilic racist attacks. Now, I'm quoting from him because it's one thing for me to say it, but as a person who used to be in the ANC. He called the vote misleading our people for cheap popularity just to win votes. The notion of a stolen land, he said, is a false narrative. We call on the ANC to pronounce themselves unambiguously as to whether they have now changed historical policy and abandoned the Freedom Charter in favor of the racist rhetoric from both the EFF and the Pan-African Congress, the PAC. Now, according to the Rural Development and Land Reform Department in South Africa, whites in South Africa own 22% of the land. And most of that, you'll notice, is in the Northern Cape. Northern Cape is semi-desert. It's very, very, very sparse. It's, in fact, I would say, one of the least watered places, it's thorn bushes. It's really rough. So most of the best land is owned by black people in the trans sky in Zululand and Pomalanga and Popo. Whites actually only have 22% of the land and most of that, most of it is semi-desert. So what's this business about 85% of the land? That is not even true, not even by their own statistics. Basically, what you've got is a fat cat wearing the ANC tie, sitting on the poor electorate, who pulling this cart full of manure called land reform, with some shriveled up old carrot in front. This is actually a pretty good description of what we're facing. EFF leader Julius Malema declared he wants to hit white men hard. We are cutting the throat of whiteness. Now imagine somebody saying this about any other racial group. DA leader, Mamozi Mayamani, and I'm only quoting him not because I respect him or think that he's a good person. He condemned the EFF for its destructive racial policy, saying it is madness, it is insane. Can only agree, but even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Considering the catastrophic consequence of communist land reform in neighboring Zimbabwe, it seems inexplicable 
that the ANC government in South Africa would want to follow in the footsteps of failure by committing economic suicide. London barrister Malcolm Horne commented on the planned land grab in South Africa, you cannot have land expropriation without compensation. It is illegal under international law. It is contrary to a dozen treaties that South Africa signed and ratified. As such, it is a principle that is also enshrined in South African domestic law. You cannot change the Constitution. Therefore, to make it legal, treaty law is always superior law. It always applies. Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. It's been said by experts in law that all law is based on God's law. And if a law is in violation of God's law, it is invalid. When Patrice Lumumba violated the constitution of the Congo and the laws of the Congo with nationalizations, the result was carnage, civil war, and total economic collapse, which the Congo has not recovered from yet. Nationalization of industries in Zambia and Tanzania brought economic collapse to those countries as well. However, vast amounts of Western foreign aid kept those countries somewhat afloat, although the vast majority of aid was stolen by corruption from the governments themselves. When Mozambique was granted independence by Mozambique, by Portugal, I don't know what the problem is with this. Well, how about if I just put this here? Yeah. Otherwise we take your race jacket off here, because I think that's what's happening. It's, it's probably the jacket. No, well, yeah, technology. When Mozambique was granted independence by Portugal in 1975, Samora Michel of Felima confiscate all private ownership, even right down to laundromats. I mean, he, he nationalized everything. He completely destroyed what was once a vibrant economy. This used to be the Grand Hotel in Byra, not very grand anymore. Before independence, Mozambique exported food. After Filimo's revolution, more than a million Mozambicans died of starvation in a green country in a country that's in the tropics. Yeah. How on earth do you starve in a place where there's bananas growing all over the place? But more than a million starved because in the cities, you're dependent on commercial farmers. And the country is torn apart by a vicious civil war. And it's extraordinary how much damage can be done by nationalization. At independence in Zimbabwe in 1980, Mozambique's Samora Michel and Tanzania's Julius Nereri actually warned Robert Mugabe do not make the same mistakes we've made, they said. They urged him respect property rights, let the Europeans continue to contribute to the economy. Amazing, I didn't know that Julius Nereri and Samora Michel had learned anything, but they had apparently learned that much. And Mugabe was warned. When Mugabe began threatening the white farmers, most media comment was, there should be no concern, Mugabe's an intelligent person, he knows that dispossessing the farmers would be a catastrophe for the country. It's not going to happen. But never underestimate people's greed. And so, indeed, over 5,000 farms were looted. Now, let's be straightforward. Land reform is not about taking a productive commercial farm from a white owner and giving it to a productive commercial black farmer. It's about looting. It's about destruction. It's got nothing to do with economic production, agricultural production. It's just greed, envy, malice, destruction. That's the way it's always worked out. And so this is what these farms look like today. Tragic. Yet Mugabe's ZANU PF government did seize over 5,000 commercial farms. And they evicted the white farmers, who in many cases were third or fourth generation citizens who had literally carved these farms out of the wilderness. They didn't steal anything. They had come to land that was full of thorn bushes and turned it into productive farms. Even as Zimbabwe's economy collapsed and more than half of the total population fled, voted with their feet, a vote of no confidence in Mugabe, most African leaders were applauding and cheering Mugabe. And he was getting standing ovations at, for example, the United Nations and at the UN Sustainable Development Conference in Durban. Standing ovations while he was not just looting the farms 
but they were also using helicopter gunships to wipe out herds of elephants for ivory to be exported to China in game reserves. South African President Thabo Mbeki unquestioningly backed Mugabe's disastrous policies in Zimbabwe. He helped keep the country from complete bankruptcy through regular aid and electricity from South Africa. As people in Zimbabwe said, when they are being electrocuted in CIO headquarters in the Chikarubi, it's with Ishkom's electricity. The land reform deception, political opportunism in Zimbabwe's land seizure era. Well, that's honest. It was political opportunism and it was a deception, a total deception. And this is the kind of result. A lot of our farms need irrigation or they're worthless. And people say we need the land redistribution for the, how do they call it? For the self-esteem, for the honor, for the integrity, for the, uh, what's the word? To restore their dignity. You don't restore dignity to people by making them starve and beg and dependent on international aid and needing to have, moving to squatter camps, fleeing the country and needing the Peace Corps from the US to come and feed them. The fall of Jacob Zuma earlier this year and the rise to power of Cyril and Posa was accompanied by a wave of euphoria and many Christians declaring, we are saved. A new day is dawning. Now we can begin to rebuild our country. Our prayers have been answered. I've been hearing that from a lot of people. Friends of mine who should know better were posting idiocy like this back then. There's obviously got to be a trick. Thank you. This is extraordinary. I even heard some major prophets and so on saying that it was their prayers and so on that brought Zuma down, brought Cyril Ramaphosa to power. I think it's better just leave it down to me. Because considering how everything's gotten worse since, uh, I don't know that I'd want to blame God for it or take the credit for the change because this has not been an upgrade. This has in fact been a plummet over the edge of the cliff. In his opening State of the Nation address to Parliament, Cyril Ramaphosa announced, we will seize land without compensation. He said it slowly, clearly, and with much emphasis, stopped and there was resounding applause. And even after that speech, you had Christians posting, we are saved, our prayers are answered. There is no salvation in politics. And these people who are making an idol of politics or politicians are going to be severely disappointed if they aren't already. Considering that South Africa provides sanctuary to more than 10 million refugees who fled endemic misrule to the north, imploding food security in South Africa will affect far more than our own population. Did you know the ANC government in South Africa is sitting on more than 4,323 farms that were handed over by their previous white owners, willing buyer, willing seller approach, but have never been transferred to black owners. It's been proven from even the research done by the government, sponsored by Tyburn Beck himself, that the land reform in this country is a failure not because of lack of resources, not because of lack of land, not because of lack of opportunity or funding or anything. It's only because of corruption, incompetence, and endemic misrule by the different departments in every one of the provinces. So the problems with the ANC themselves, as it was in Zimbabwe with ZANU, but it's good to have a scapegoat. Because a nation of sheep will be ruled by a government of wolves, and they are fat cats on the gravy train, and they are now needing a scapegoat to justify their worthless existence and their failure for the last 24 years. In 1994, when Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa, we had 70,000 white commercial farmers who were feeding over 100 million people throughout Africa. And that was when we had a population of 28 million. We were feeding four times more than our population. Today we have barely 28,000 commercial farmers left who are able to feed about 40 million people, but our population has more than doubled. South Africa's population is now in excess of 58 million. Even as the population of the country has doubled since 1994, our food production is less than 40% what it was in 1994. And this is from, uh, from 2017, so you can see the population has skyrocketed 
while our food production has plummeted. The food crisis in Africa is about to get much, much, much worse, and so is the refugee crisis. Bear in mind, Rhodesia used to export food. No one starved in Rhodesia, even during droughts. But today, Zimbabwe is dependent on hundreds of millions of tons of food aid coming in, and South Africa is about to join those ranks. And our people are about to join the ranks of the refugees, if they go ahead with this plan. The ANC government's been a complete failure on every level. In 1994, the rand was closer to two rand to the dollar. Today, it's around 14 rand to the dollar. How? Back in 1994, we'd just come out of sanctions, war, strikes, riots, conscription. Now, foreign aid, no war, and so on, and our economy is plummeting, obviously through socialist misrule. I remember my first mission driving from Cape Town to Johannesburg, 1982, fuel cost me 32 rand. And I think I ended up with a full fuel tank at that. So we used to be able to fill the tank with five rand. I remember that. Now 100 rand won't even get your needle out of the red empty zone. The economy has been going down. Why? Zimbabwe, even after they'd taken a 16 zeros off in 2008, a hundred trillion dollar note could not buy a loaf of bread. It couldn't buy a quarter of a loaf of bread. Unemployment in South Africa in 1994 was under 3 million. Today, unemployment in South Africa is closer to 30 million. And by the way, don't believe government statistics. They say unemployed is 24%, but then they have discouraged work seekers and economically inactive, which brings it to over 50%. So we've got, in fact, more than what most people would think economically inactive and discouraged work seekers, that's unemployed. I mean, they've just tried to make three categories out of one. We've got an unemployment of over 54%. That means we've got more people unemployed today than there were people in South Africa in 1994. For every year the ANC's been in power, they've added a million more unemployed to the unemployed ranks. A million more unemployed every single year. Our universities are so worthless that 85% of those who enter our universities don't graduate. Now, they either drop off or they fail. And those who pass might have got 30% or 24%. And they call that a pass. So 85% of our university or tertiary education people don't graduate, which means 85% shouldn't even be going into university. And our taxpayer money is subsidizing them to riot and burn the campuses. So look at this kind of worthless nonsense. So they've got unemployed here, 16%. They've got employed, 43%. And then the green is economically inactive, 35%. Discouraged work seekers, 6%. So there you can see how governments lie, 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 and lie again. They are the cause of unemployment. Why is unemployment increasing? Because of mindless idiocy and all kinds of statements about confiscating land, which chase away employers, chases away investor conference, chases away tourists, and all the rest. And you can see also the distribution of work between 1994 and 1914, and agriculture is plummeting as a source of employment. Wonder why? Power failures, water restrictions, rampant crime, rape and murder become everyday realities for the long-suffering people of South Africa. Yet most of our people have head in the sand, don't want to acknowledge it, Stockholm Syndrome. To distract citizens from the disastrous failure and catastrophic corruption of the ANC government, just like Mugabe, Zanu, PF and Zimbabwe back in 2000, lies, distortions, disinformation, fabrications, misleading statistics, and campaigns of guilt manipulation have been manufactured to create a smokescreen to cover the rampant corruption and incompetence of the ANC. A British editorial coined the term ineptocracy, specifically to refer to the ANC. A system of government where the least capable to lead are elected by the least capable of producing and where the members of society least likely to sustain themselves or succeed are awarded with goods and services paid for by the confiscated wealth of a diminishing number of producers. Ineptocracy. 
In fact, what most people don't understand is that the African National Congress, while it started as a legitimate nationalist, black nationalist organization in 1912, it was hijacked in the 1950s by the Southern Communist Party. And in fact, every single president of the ANC since the 90s has been a member of the Southern Communist Party and right to this present day. To enable the looting of the country, whites have been demonized and made scapegoats for every problem. Even after 24 years of ANC rule, nothing is accepted as their fault. I mean, why vote for people who aren't responsible? Even when they've got total power for 24 years, everything in the country is the fault of the minority, who now are less than 9%. Whites are to blame. Very convenient. Instead, irresponsible politicians have engaged in the most reckless rabble-rousing and hate-mongering, which threatens to subvert the very fabric of society. Society is a delicate balance. You've got to respect property. You've got to respect your neighbor. You've got to respect lives. You've got to respect laws. You cannot have an economy working without respect for law and life and property. I used to hitchhike across this country. I hitchhiked 140,000 kilometers in the early years of this mission, before we could afford petrol and a vehicle. 140,000 kilometers. Many times I just rolled out my sleeping bag by the side of the road or in a park and slept without any fear. Sometimes it would be raining and I'd go to a church, open a door, the churches weren't locked generally, especially in the small towns, and I could sleep in my sleeping bag on a pew or on the carpet in the church and leave in the morning, nobody even knew I was there. I even remember spending one night sleeping in a baptistry in Port Alfred Baptist Church uh, because it was really hot and it's the coolest place in the church. And that was not difficult to just camp out almost anywhere. I remember being able to, in rain, knock on somebody's door in the middle of nowhere in a town I'd never been to, people I don't know and say, excuse me, would you mind if I... Uh, rolled out my sleeping bag on your porch to be out of the rain. Oh, don't worry about that, come on in. Our son's not here, take his bedroom and so on. Strangers were like that. You didn't have to navigate barbed wire, security gates, razor wire, killer dogs and all sorts of things. You could literally walk up to people's doors and knock on the door and they would open it. So the, the situation in the country has changed dramatically and young people don't know this because they, they don't know what it's like. My sons have to worry about being locked out of the house. I never had to worry about being locked out of the house. I don't know if our house was ever locked. And if the front door was locked, I'd go to the back door. I never had to, but if, I, if that was locked, which it never was, I could have climbed through windows because we didn't have burglar bars and the windows weren't all shut. If I saw my dad's car downtown in Bulawayo, I could, if I had something like books and library or something, I could go and put it in the car because the car wouldn't be locked. The keys were probably in the ignition. I don't think people realize what's happened now. Imagine if all the money that's been spent on razor wire, burglar bars, walls, every kind of security was able to be put into product things. Well, maybe we wouldn't have the same unemployment we've got right now. At his presidential inauguration in 1994, Nelson Mandela declared, never, never, never again will any South African be discriminated against on the basis of their race. And do you remember the applause? Yeah. This was what the people wanted to hear. Never again. Now, let me just say, my two daughters, Andrea and Daniela, they were born under apartheid, so-called, 1991-1993. Their birth certificate has no race mentioned. They're born under apartheid, but there's no race in their birth certificate because that was basically removed at that time. However, my two sons who were born under Nelson Mandela's presidency, they have their race mentioned in their birth certificate, born 1995 and 1999. Why? Because Nelson Mandela brought race classification back to the country. We had abolished race classification already in the early 90s, and we brought it back in the late 90s for affirmative action. This was immediately followed by affirmative action, Black Economic Empowerment, or BBBEE, -E, broad-based Black Economic Empowerment, and racial quotas, and even for sports teams, which have only succeeded in chasing away investors, employers, 
entrepreneurs and tourists, increasing unemployment. Literally, there are companies who are told you're not allowed to donate to any impoverished whites, even if they're in squatter camps. Would this be considered hate speech to say kill the, well, any other group or tribal grouping? But somehow this is not hate speech. Instead of addressing their failed policies, the ANC have continued to throw good money off the bad, hell bent on promoting immoral, unwise, and counterproductive policies on every level. You know, if you think of anybody, any human being in any situation, if they're not willing to take responsibility for their failures, or their actions, or their words, or their postings, whatever, there's something wrong with them. One of the first things we try to teach children is stop making excuses, stop blaming others, take responsibility. What is the matter when we've got a government that has less maturity than our preschool kids? Now heedless to warnings of the catastrophic decolonization land reform policy of Joseph Stalin in the Ukraine and the Soviet Union in the 1930s, and the Holocaust in Rwanda in 1994, and I was there in Rwanda. Yep, older technology looks good. Thank you. Do I, do I switch this off now? Yes, please. Good. I was in Rwanda observing every aspect of the Holocaust. I documented it, I've written the books Holocaust in Rwanda. More people were killed with machetes in Rwanda. 800,000 killed with machetes in Rwanda in just six weeks than have died from nuclear weapons in all of history. In Natarama, in this church, I saw the bodies of something like 1,200 people in one church building. This is outside Natarama Church. The skulls and the bones of an entire congregation wiped out with machetes in 1994. Not killed with guns. This is a gun-free zone. The people had been disarmed by the United Nations. People fled. Phenomenal destruction caused by race hatred. I was in a political meeting some years ago when the head of the ANC in the area was saying, when Nelson Mandela dies, we're going to kill you whites like flies. And I said, like Rwanda? And he said, yes, exactly like Rwanda. And I said, have you seen how that turned out? Do you notice that the victims are now the victors? Daniel beat Goliath. The Tutsi minority are now running the country, only 9%, but the majority completely destroyed their credibility by getting involved in this genocide so that now nobody can question the right of the minority tribe, the Tutsi in Rwanda, to run. And have you noticed that the Tutsi in Rwanda did not have a tradition and a heritage of war like the Boers in South Africa have? I said, you try something like genocide and see how fast that boomerangs on your back. I said, you never won a skirmish, you never won a battle. You weren't any kind of liberation force. You're just murdering civilians, landmines, limpet mines. You don't know how to fight. So if you want a genocide, you're going to see how fast the civil war turns against you. He was silent after that. Rwanda is an example of what hatred can do. Race hatred, tribal hatred. Hotel Rwanda is not a very good film, not well made. It's the American version, shallow as anything, all made in South Africa. Everyone in the film was either American or South African playing Rwandese. Shooting Dogs was more accurate. That was filmed in Rwanda with the Rwandese playing Rwandese. Shake Hands with the Devil was also filmed in Rwanda. This is based on a book by the Canadian General Romeo Deliere, who is the leader of the United Nations peacekeeping force, so-called, in, in Rwanda. He wrote that they knew that genocide was coming. He had warned the Secretary General of the UN and Warren Christopher, Butrus Butrus Ghali, Kofi Annan, they all knew about it. Bill Clinton's government knew about it. Bill Clinton had the details on his desk by January 1994. He was forbidden 
to confiscate the million machetes provided by Red China. He wanted to confiscate them before in hand. He knew they were there. They were in the warehouse before they were distributed throughout the country to enter Hamburg, forbidden by Kofi Annan. And we could continue, but this, this film is more accurate, showing you what happened in Rwanda. And he ends off the book saying, could we have prevented the genocide? Yes. Should the UN have done more? Of course. His book subtitle is The Failure of Humanity in Rwanda. <laughs> Not the failure of the UN, the failure of humanity. And thinking of the catastrophic land reform policies of Zimbabwe, that the ANC now wants to remove constitutional safeguards on private ownership property. We've seen in Zimbabwe how this goes. Land reform is nothing other than looting, pillaging, and destruction. This is what is the result of land reform in Zimbabwe. In fact, let me show you a few pictures that sort of dramatize what goes on. This man had a bottle smashed over his face in front of police in Samora Michelle Avenue in downtown Harare. And he turned to the police and said, are you not meant to protect the citizens of Zimbabwe? And the police said, no. Our job is to enforce the policy of the government. And so, two male, two pale, well, even female and pale, this farmer was murdered outside Bulawayo back in 2001. He had sent his wife at polio and his two daughters to town in Bulawayo. He stayed. He knew something was going to happen. One morning he came out and he was shot in the leg. He went back in his house, got his rifle and shotgun, and for the next three hours had a shooting battle with a hundred North Korean trained 5th Brigade with full battle gear, AK-47s and all. And this farmer fought for three hours, keeping them at bay, killing 18 of them, injuring many, only when he ran out of ammunition were they able to burn him out and kill him. And at the same time, he'd phone, he had gotten a radio, Agric Alert, the other farmers had come, police roadblocks kept them at bay, ambulance was called, they weren't allowed in until they'd killed this farmer only then were the neighbors and the ambulances allowed in. However, that's when farm invasions, violent farm invasions stopped because they realized this isn't a good idea and they worked other ways. On the left, you can see the way it used to be and on the right, you can see the way it is now. This is the result of land reform in Zimbabwe, expropriation without compensation. This is the result. You can see the difference that irrigation makes for example, in a desolate wilderness. In fact, the economy is much like this vehicle, overloaded and about to break down. The latest in ambulance technology in Zimbabwe. The new Toyota Carolla. You have to be innovative to survive in Zimbabwe. And the people in Zimbabwe, some of those innovative people around, Women gathering to pray outside a government building in Harare being beaten by the police. Samora Michelle Avenue, downtown Harare. This is the face of freedom and liberation. Boot on the neck being whipped by police dressed in battle gear carrying AK-47 assault rifles. This is the way it goes. And all the problems in Zimbabwe is not the fault of Mugabe, no, it's the fault of the media, the unpatriotic whites, the gays, Britain, America, expatriates, which all spells Mugabe. And when the moment arrived for South Africa to say something, Mbeki said, um, it's been documented, it's a disaster. Your city on socialism is a mess. Your hospital on socialism is a disgrace. Your grocery store on socialism is pretty empty. But your politician socialism, boy, they always do well. They want to be able to expropriate farms without even compensation for farmers who've poured generations of sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears, and hard work into cultivating the wilderness and turning it into productive farms. They didn't come and take this farm. They built it. If the ANC go ahead with this ill-advised policy, it'll not only undermine food security in South Africa, it'll greatly increase Unemployment, it'll chase away even more investors, more employers, more entrepreneurs, and more tourists. The economic consequences and social catastrophe that would result from such a racist and lawless policy would be incalculable. 
It would represent the final breaking of faith with the reconciliation statements and settlements made in 1994. Remember, in 1994, we were on the brink of civil war. And the only thing that prevented war was the constitutional arrangement and settlement, which included respect for law, respect for providential property, and so on. Violating solemn international agreements and destroying the very Bill of Rights, which is meant to be the foundation for prosperity and progress in this country, will have catastrophic repercussions. Catastrophic. Not just for our country. One cannot violate private ownership property without destroying the essential foundation for all effective economies. Greed and envy and covetousness and theft do not end well. What you reap is what you sow. And yes, unintended consequences. There's always unintended consequences for anything. And let's face it, this is just a bunch of fat cats trying to exploit well-meaning people for something they know cannot succeed. The EFF may think that kicking white South Africans in the back is going to help, but prosperity is a delicate balance. If people don't have confidence in the economy, the currency debases and you have hyperinflation like in Zimbabwe. If you don't have investor confidence, well, you don't have much employment. So here you've got a map of South Africa with a begging bowl saying, may I have some food? And the answer is, no! But at least the land is mine. The great South African land scandal was written a long time ago under Mbeki. I mean, I think this book's 10 years old by now. But what that spoke about was the land reform scandal where they would be taking productive farms that employed and produced and brought in foreign currency and did all sorts of good things and then handing it over, pouring millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions into farms that just went down the drain and those farms are wrecked, those farmers don't have work, they don't have homes, everything's destroyed. They have poured not millions, not hundreds of millions, they've poured billions of rands into land reform with nothing to show for it but a lot of shells and wrecked places and the skeletons of milk cows that were butchered and eaten and so on. It would appear that insane hatred will destroy this great country and it will destroy the last chance for Africa to show a viable, successful, working economy to the world. Remember, most people outside of Africa can't tell the difference between South Africa and any other part. You know, when, a bad, when something bad happens in the Congo or in Zimbabwe, we get people cancelling coming to our camps or courses in Cape Town. Tourists cancel because they hear something bad happened in Cameroon. They don't know the difference, most of them out there. You know, it's like you hear something like an earthquake hit Nepal or a flood or tsunami hit Indonesia or uh, there's a hurricane hit the United States. Many of us think of the whole country affected because you're not there. It's only a small part, maybe. But most people don't understand the geography and can't distinguish. And the fact is, they've heard so much bad news out of Africa. If South Africa was to fail on this, I think many would just give up on the continent and the result would be disastrous. And bear in mind, we're talking about some of the greatest, most productive farms on the planet. Our farmers, in fact, to be a farmer in South Africa, you must be some of the most resilient, hardworking, tenacious, courageous people around. You don't have softies in South African farming anymore. The people who are still in farming after all these years and all the murders and all the attacks and hatreds, these people are tough and they're good and they're effective. And people from around the world want them. I spoke with Levi Mwanawasa, president of Zambia. When I met with him, Zambia had just doubled the value of the quacha. And I said, congratulations, Mr. President, on the, uh, the first positive revaluing of any African currency since independence. And he said, don't thank me, thank Mugabe. I raised my eyebrow, I said, yes, those white farmers he was kicking out, I welcomed them, we gave them land, and they turned our economy around. 200 Zimbabwean farmers came in, and what they did was they managed to feed the country, boost the economy, bring us um, exports, foreign currency. I mean, just bring in 200 farmers that Zimbabwe had thrown away turned Zimbabwe's, uh, Zambia's economy around and Levi Mwanawasa gave them the credit for the tremendous upturn they had in the economy at that point. We have got Mozambique and Nigeria 
and countries all over Africa pleading with South African farmers to come to them, saying, we'll give you land. With Nigeria saying, we'll give you a million US dollars, um, what do you call it, um, grant instantly. If you'll come, we'll give you land and everything. Because they know their economy needs South African farmers. Russia is inviting thousands of South African farmers to come in there right now. So what is it that all over the world, all over Africa, even next door in Mozambique, they want white South African farmers, but South Africa doesn't. Oh, of course, they've already got our doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, all over. Do you know that South Africa is lacking right now 40,000 water engineers, short. Now, there are enough water engineers to take the jobs, but they're the wrong color. And these are reserve jobs. And so we are 40,000 short of water engineers. And if you wondered why people are getting dysentery, cholera, and so on in some areas, because they don't have water engineers sanitizing the municipal water. Because even though the people are available, they're the wrong color. The disgrace that this would be to Africa as a whole, and the disillusionment it would create amongst those who have poured their hearts and souls into building Africa up, and I must include myself into this. I have poured my heart and soul into serving the people of Africa all over as far as Sudan, Nigeria. If this government can get away with this, if the people in this country will not wake up, shake up, if the silent majority won't rebel at the polls next year and boot these corrupt criminals out, people like me would be so disillusioned you think, what on earth is the point of investing in so many places if they're just going to steal it and destroy it at the end? Well, I could really point to mission stations, Bible colleges, farms, and so on that I have built up all over, which have been taxed and closed down by governments or stolen. Vehicles that we've donated to churches that have been stolen. Bicycles we've donated to evangelists and chaplains in the field that have been stolen by government officials and so on. And you appeal to the government of people that don't do it. So what do we do? We stop. I won't work there anymore. There's a lot of us who are about up to here with it. South Africa would just join the long list of failed African states. Yet another warning to outsiders to not even try to invest in a continent who cannot respect private ownership property cannot honor solemn agreements, bills of rights, or international treaties. Is this the kind of city we want? Is this the kind of agriculture we want? Is this the future we're offering our children? What dignity when they have to scoop water out of a mud hole? There's no human dignity in starvation. There's no dignity in depending on the handouts of bleeding heart do-gooder liberals from America. So is emotion to replace reason? Are slogans to overwhelm debate? Is expropriation to supersede economics? You know, from the very beginning of Nelson Mandela's presidency, they had land reform. They said anyone whose land has ever been expropriated, ever, your grandparents or whatever, come forward. And they were offering them land or money. And almost everyone, something like 98%, wanted money. They didn't want the land. So Mandela's been, and America, been giving money to people who claimed our land was taken. You know, it might have been desert or thornbush, but nevertheless, they were getting compensated. But next to nobody wanted the land. They just wanted the money, an economic power. And so the lands remained vacant. This country has been going backwards agriculturally. Are toy toy zombie dancers to replace work? Is race hatred to replace good neighborliness? You notice that is a police van behind. And a person thinks he can have a hate speech slogan in front of a police van and he's not worried about consequences, is threatening to kill people, not hate speech? If settlers who came centuries ago and cultivated the wilderness, if they to be called colonists and invaders, are black migrants to Europe, America, Australia, and South Africa also to be called invaders and colonialists? By definition in the dictionary, there are. Vilifying the victims and villains playing the victim card may work for a time, but ultimately it'll come back to destroy the one playing this dangerous game. 
The malicious destruction of so many historic places, so many monuments, so many graves, so many churches, so many homes, entire forests, twice. In the last two years, we have had arson destroying vast forests around George and Neisner. 56 separate fires started last year around Neisner, and the fire department at times said it was arson, and it was, oh, don't make conclusions, we've got to investigate. Well, when the investigation was concluded about 10 months later, Arson. But you probably didn't notice because it wasn't exactly put in the front news headlines and I bet SATV ignored it. But the people in Nyson and George know their farms were burned down, their forests were burned down, their homes were destroyed by malicious arsonists. And the prison at that time, when asked, what are you going to do for the people who've lost everything in Nyson, his answer was, nothing. They're not our people. They didn't vote for us. So Ramposa said earlier this year, we're going to take farms from white people and give them to our people. So are white South Africans no longer South Africans? Are we no longer our people? We no longer enjoy protection of the Constitution? Destruction for the sake of it. Envy, greed, hatred and jealousy do not build the kind of society any of us would want to live in. Amos 5 verse 15, hate evil. Love good. Establish justice in the gate. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. This ill-advised policy of expropriating land without compensation is based on a broad propaganda narrative of righting the wrongs of long ago, taking back what was stolen. In a word, restitution. But who stole the land? Where was it stolen? From whom was it stolen? When was it stolen? And how was it stolen? I believe Afroforum has offered 100,000 rand to anyone who can point out any land that was stolen by whites in this country. And they've offered this cash often. I believe it's still a valid offer. And nobody's taken them up on it. The fact is the Dutch settlers and the fortrekkers purchased their land and settled and developed the wilderness at great personal sacrifice. There was always payment. Truth does not fear investigation. Facts can ruin a good story. Marxist revolutionaries and agitators use propaganda to whip up hatred for their own political ends. However, if we were to realize and consider the real theft taking place in our time, we'd recognize no one has stolen from us more than our government has. The greatest theft is from inflation, taxation, and corruption. The African Union calculates that every year over 25% of the gross domestic product, the GDP, 25% of the entire GDP of the continent is stolen every year by African governments. That is more than 10 times, more than 1,000% all the foreign aid received by Africa every year. We would not need foreign aid if we could cut corruption by just 10%. If we could cut corruption by 20%, imagine cutting corruption by 40 or 80%. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. 2 Peter 2.19 could be written across many governments. If we could cut corruption just a little, imagine what eradicating 90% of corruption would do. You know, America's got a billionaire president as well. He doesn't take a salary. And he's lowered taxes. We've got a billionaire president whose first task was to increase taxes on the poor through increasing VAT. In Kandla is nothing. This is pocket change. This isn't even petty cash in the scheme of things. 260 million rand? Nothing. Inflation has devalued the South African rand to 1,500 what it was back in 1980. And that I learned from Stephen Mitford Goodson who was the director of the Southern Reserve Bank for 11 years. A survey on inflation in South Africa undertaken by the Old Mutual reported in 1971 you could buy a car for about 1,000 Rand. In 1981 you could buy a motorbike for 1,000 Rand. In fact, I bought my first motorbike in 1981 for 1,000 Rand. By the year 2001, the buying power of 1,000 Rand had collapsed so much you could buy a bicycle for 1,000 Rand. I bought Bicycles for sedan at roughly 1,000 rand each in 2001, so I know that's true. My son now informs me, he's a marathon runner, 
a good pair of running shoes cost over 2,000 rand. So we've gone from a motor car to shoes, one shoe, sorry, not a pair of shoes, just one shoe, in, since 1971. Proverbs 11.1, 1, the Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. The theft of so much hard work and ingenuity by exorbitant taxation and rampant corruption by ANC government is vastly greater than all other causes of poverty combined. Over 100, no, forget that, over 1 trillion rand is lost to corruption in South Africa every year. That's a conservative estimate. Now, this is an early, this is just, this is back in Mbeki's years. Okay, when you said at that stage that we had lost 675 billion to corruption, this is, this is official. What would that build? Well, 375 billion rand would build 10 hospitals and run them for 18 years. 50 billion rand could host 10 World Cup, uh, World Cup soccers. 216 billion could build 4 million more houses. You might recall it, we heard from Jacob Zuma, corruption doesn't hurt anyone. Actually, corruption hurts everyone. Okay, I know this is dollars, but um, we've got 100 rand notes. So just imagine that's a 100 rand note. So you start here, this is, um, everyone's seen one of these. This is 10,000. Okay, you can fit it in your pocket. Easily. Okay, this is a million dollars or million rand. That's 100 packets of 10,000 each. You can put it in a grocery bag, carry it around. One million. This is a hundred million. You can fit it in a one ton uh, pallet. We work with pallets of literature all the time. Okay, standard pallet. Here's a billion dollars or billion rand of 100 notes. That's 10 pallets. Okay, now we're talking about a billion. Now, think of a trillion. By the way, do you see that person there? There's the person. Okay, let's, let's, that's one trillion. A million million, a thousand billion. There's a pentecnican, there's a person, there's his little stack by his feet. And there's the pallet. Our government steals more than this every year. And they want you to believe that they've got to increase VAT in order to pay the bills. They've got to take farms without compensation because there's not enough money for it. They need you to do this and you need to do that and so on and so forth. And we need foreign aid. And These people are looting the entire country. Forget state capture. They've captured a long time ago. This would fill a football field, take more space than a 747 Jumbo Jet's wingspan. Just think, corruption is killing us. That's no jokes. Governments create wealth the same way ticks create blood. My wife, being brought up in Austria, was absolutely pathologically terrified of anything with lots of legs and so one day I brought my son back from the farm and she phoned quite uh, irate and distressed because my son had a tick on her back so I dashed home my girls are standing around my wife how do you get this tick off I said well it's quite simple you take some Vaseline and you put the Vaseline over uh, the, where the tick is because you can't try and dig it out or pull him out because he'll just dig deeper and you, if you leave bits of his legs in there it's going to get septic and so just put Vaseline on he can't breathe the tick will climb up and sure enough you could see the tick climbing out of Calvin's back and as he came out I picked him up put him on the counter and he started to crawl sideways my wife and girl screamed I smacked it blood split everywhere more screams and I thought this moment, this is a teachable moment. <laughs> you don't get opportunities like this often. My daughter said, whose blood is that? Calvin's, more screams. I said, this tick is like the ANC government. It produces nothing except disease and infection. It lives off the blood of its citizens. It's a blood-sucking parasite. Poly ticks, poly many ticks, blood-sucking parasites, politics, 
many blood-sucking parasites. Micah 6, verse 11 to 12. Shall I count pure those with wicked scales and a bag of deceitful weights? For her rich men are full of violence. Her inhabitants have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. God hates unjust weights and measures. That's why when Jesus came to the temple, he took a whip and he chased the bankers, the money changers out. Bunch of criminals. Nobody steals more than governments and banks. Skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, I will never forgive. Now, I don't know much about economics. I learned at commerce class, economics class in Rhodesia, never get in debt, never high purchase anything, save up and buy cash, never get in debt, and if you're in debt, get out of debt fast. And that stayed in my mind, and that's served me better than a lot of other people's knowledge of economics, as I've seen missions crash and burn, live by presumption, not by faith, and people get into debt and destroy themselves. But Stephen Mitford Goodson, who is a graduate of Ghent and Stellenbosch University's director of South Reserve Bank, he wrote Inside the South Reserve Bank, and he also wrote A History of Central Banking and the Enslavement of Mankind, basically explained like this. The South African Reserve Bank is not South African. It has no reserves, and it's no bank. The, just like the Federal Reserve Bank of America is not federal, it has no reserves, it isn't a bank. He said, it's a scheme, it's a scam. So, imagine this, the government walks in and says, we need a billion rand. No problem, they sign out a check for a billion rand, gives the government a billion rand. They just entered in the computer, they've created a billion rand out of nothing. It didn't exist. Now the printing presses print out a billion rand, and the government's got a billion rand spent. But that's not real money. It's just created out of thin air by the Reserve Bank. But the interest that we taxpayers have to pay every year on that is real. Do you know, in the Middle Ages, by the 13th and 14th centuries, people in Europe had so much free time because they didn't have bankers. They abolished usury, no banking allowed, none of this interest rates. And so people only had to work about 140 days a year. And they used the excess time to build the cathedrals as expressions of their um, wonderful faith, their work ethic, and also of the productivity of their societies. When they got into banks and allowed these banksters to come in and charge interest, then they were having to work most of the year and had very little left over and the standard of living plummeted. The bankers have been looting... Now, that's not my opinion. I'm not giving you my theory here. That's what economist and previous director of the Southern Reserve Bank told us. In fact, Stephen Mitford Goodson, you can Google him on uh, TV when he spoke on national TV about state capture. He said, state capture started when Jan Smuts brought in the Southern Reserve Bank. And Jan Smuts... Uh, and, and Prime Minister Hendrik Verwoerd was assassinated when he uh, initiated the Hook Report as to how to replace the Southern Reserve Bank with a truly South African bank and not one that's run by the Rothschilds and the international banking community, next thing he's stabbed to death in, in Parliament. And this, Stephen Goodson, goes into all the history of it quite in detail. But the point is, we are dealing with colossal theft. How long are we going to accept smoke screens, scapegoats, distractions, and disinformation of the criminals who are ruining the country. The middle letter of cancer is ANC. My wife has survived cancer twice. She runs cancer surviving dragon boating and represents cancer people on media, and she's in the hospitals counseling. A cancer is any cell in your body that doesn't contribute to the health of the body, but breaks down the health of the body. The ANC are a cancer. They have done nothing for this country. They've given this country nothing. They've done nothing to help anybody except themselves. They are a cancer. Power cuts by Ishkom, just between 2008 and 2015, cost the South African economy over 300 billion rand. The additional diesel costs of Ishkom to run their power stations due to human error at Kuburg Nuclear Power Station 2015 loan was estimated to be 250 million rand per week. 
just the diesel cost. Stage three load shedding was estimated to cost the southern economy over 80 billion per month. The severe water restrictions in Cape Town, which has led to a drastic decrease in the number of international tourists visiting our city. Last year, tourism accounted for 9% of South Africa's economy, most of it went to Cape Town, 35 billion US dollars worth. We're about to lose all of that tourism if we go ahead with this insanity of expropriation without compensation. You probably don't have to do this in Johannesburg and Randburg, but we have to queue for water. 87% of small businesses in Cape Town have reported losing half their revenue due to water restrictions. Water Resources Partners estimates 30% of South Africa's water in urban areas is wasted through leakages. Not private leakages, municipal leakages, the big pipes. Sometimes flowing these leaks for years without the municipalities fixing them. Soweto residents have reported major water delivery pipes have leaked for years without the municipality doing a thing about it. Oh, <laughs> our city council in Cape Town, they talk about this is the worst drought in Cape Town, 127 years. What a lot of rubbish. It's the worst drought we've had in eight years. We had a worse drought eight years ago. Uh, it's the worst water restrictions and the worst water mismanagement in the history of Cape Town, but it's not the worst drought. Statistically, we've had less water per year on many years before, but lies, lies, and more lies. Pr Patricia DeLille, who we call Corella DeLille, hates Cape Townians, despises us, and says she's so glad for the opportunity to stick it to the whites and have them walk around with buckets of water all day. That's what uh, Corin Brainerd, one of the DA councillors who resigned last year after 11 years in DA, said she couldn't take the race hatred of Patricia DeLille. Says she's still Pan-African Congress. She is still a terrorist at heart. I remember seeing Patricia DeLille leading a march in 1993 past the St. James Church, the month after the St. James Massacre, to demand the release of the terrorists who had been captured for murdering the people in the church chanting she was in front and they were all chanting one church one bomb one minister one bullet kill the boer kill the farmer one set the one bullet one church one bomb one minister one bullet and she became mayor of cape town oh <clears throat> how do you like this for cape town newspaper city water underspends 1.6 billion let me put it another way the city overtaxed us 1.6 billion for water last year. One year, one city, Cape Town. They, they increased our water bills so shockingly that we literally paid 1.6 billion more than the expenses. And that's even lying for their corruption, wastage, affirmative action, everything else. To complain about service delivery, the ANC supporters and the EFF supporters burn trains. Well, that's going to help the trains run on time. The war on whites in South Africa is also seen in economics through black economic empowerment, affirmative action, job reservations, racial quotas, even for sports teams, all of which are designed to keep whites, particularly white males, too male, too pale, out of government, out of commercial employment. But the violent, vicious, and brutally sadistic tortures and murders of farmers and their farm families and their members defies description. Farm attacks in South Africa are 700% higher than any other country in the world. Right now, the most dangerous job in the world is being a white commercial farmer in South Africa. More dangerous than being a bomb disposal expert in the American army in Afghanistan. Afroforum has documented multiple cases of incitement to genocide and menacing threats against whites on social media, including ANC counselor, Bekin Nkosi Mavalasi, kill the boer, kill the farmer. Or this Falafi Kamala of the Kauteng Arts and Culture Department. I want to cleanse this country of all white people. White people in South Africa deserve to be hacked and killed. You must be bushed alive, whatever that means, and skinned and your offspring be used as garden fertilizer. He's still working for the government. I want to cleanse the country of all white people. We must act as Hitler did. Lovuya Maxim Zima, I hate white people, just get me a bazooka or AK-47, I can do the right thing and kill those demon-possessed humans. Is this not hate speech? 
kill the boar, kill the farmer. White South Africa is your time is up. Uh, pack the bags, suffer the consequences. And it carries on. And of course, the swearing and swearing and all this. Our farm killers should keep far killing farmers and if possible, rape their women, little daughters, infect them with AIDS. I use my guns to rob and kill Indians and whites. Please, fellas, join me. We have to rape the kids with AIDS virus too. This isn't hate speech, don't worry. I'm the Messiah of our time. I will give free land to my people. Unlike Jesus or Nelson Mandela, I don't need to go to a stupid prison to save my people, says my lemma. This is not the way to build good neighborliness. This is not funny. Nicholas murders brutally tortured a thousand people to death. Every time I hear the name of Jesus, I'm reminded of white people. I'm glad he won't come back because if he comes back, we'll kill him again and cremate his body. This is from BLF leader Andili Mangistama. He doesn't have a chance. When Jesus returns, the wicked will be calling for the mountains to cover them. They'd prefer to be buried under an avalanche and to face the wrath of the land. But don't worry, the police are on top of it. Farmers are being murdered at a rate of four times more than even the police in this country. And the murder of police in this country is outrageously unacceptable. White South African farmers are experiencing the highest rates of violent crime in the world. Afro Forum has noted the term farm murders is misleading. Farm torture would be more accurate. Farmers in South Africa are being murdered at a rate of 220 per 100,000. People are murdered around the world an average of nine per 100,000. The average murder rate of 220 per 100,000 for farmers, it's just out of all control. The criminal justice system is spectacularly failing to prosecute most of those perpetrators of these attacks. Here's a picture from a CCTV camera before a farm attack. This is a military issue cell phone jammer. Are the military in South Africa involved in farm attacks? There's a lot of evidence that elements are. Farm family members are often tied up, cut with machetes, pitchforks, burned with boiling water, hot irons, dragged behind vehicles, raped and mutilated in incomprehensible savagery. This is not funny. Imagine if you had a black baby doll with people wearing some uniform of, let's say, Freedom Front. Would that be considered a problem? How is it okay for the ANC veterans to be dressed up doing this kind of, let's hang a white baby? The South African Agricultural Union recorded 10,000 farm attacks and 1,500 farm murders between 1994 and 2008. It's hard to get statistics. The government doesn't want to give you statistics, so we've got to go on different groups. Now, this is the South African Agricultural Union. 10,000 attacks, 1,500 murders, just between 94 and 2008. The Transvaal Agricultural Union recorded 2,070 attacks and 1,266 murders between 1991 and 2009. The South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry calculates that every farm murder or attack costs the South African economy over 2 million rand. It's like stealing 2 million rand like that in the national economy when you kill a farmer. This is based on an annual contribution of the agricultural sector to the country's gross domestic product. Of course, a person's life is worth more than 2 million, but they're just putting an economic uh, number on it. Land of Sorrow, 20 years of farm attacks in South Africa documented just the names and the places, the dates, and some details about the attacks. And it's actually so distressing. I have not managed to read much of it because it's just too distressing. When Freedom Front Member of Parliament Peter Grunewald reported on the horrific murders being inflicted on white farmers South Africa today, an ANC Member of Parliament jeered and shouted, bury them alive. And he was not Disciplined for this kind of hate speech in Parliament? Destruction is in its midst. Oppression, deceit, do not depart from its streets. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set, we read in Proverbs 22, verse 28. Here follows a compilation of quotes and policies from ANC leaders. Quote, unquote. All white people are criminals and should be treated as such. We need to take their property, deny them job opportunities, and treat them as second-class citizens. White people are racists, 
sorry, white people are rapists, dogs, and cowards. We need to sing songs about how they should be mowed down and murdered. White people are in the minority, and that means they must have fewer rights than the rest of us. All over the world, affirmative action is to protect minorities against majorities. Only in South Africa and Zimbabwe are affirmative action policies to protect the majority against the minority. Still quoting from the ANC. Absolutely, that's how democracy works. They have fewer rights. And if they dare to protest against these views, we must tell them to keep their mouths shut because they're racist who are simply getting what they deserve. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who just find a wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. So what can we do? Well, we can all do something. This first and foremost an information war. I mean, for how many of you here are some of the things that I shared today news? How many of you have heard things today you didn't know about? Now, how is that possible? Because we're living amongst us. It just shows our media is not giving us the facts. We need to be informed that people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Their resource we need to set the record straight. I've seen a need to produce the book sketches from South African history because there's so much ignorance about South African history. There's so much disinformation and lies, especially in school textbooks now and, and in monuments and museums. I've seen need to try and explain some of the history from a Christian perspective. Sketches from South African history, especially designed for homeschoolers. One should obtain the Agenda 2 film, which explains how communism works internationally, and Bitter Harvest, that DVD, is a, it's a, it would be in your video shops, Bitter Harvest is documenting what happened with land reform in Russia and Ukraine. I've set up at the beginning of this year the Henry Morton Stanley School of Christian Journalism as a project to try and present unbiased, uncensored news, and we did this in January. Before I knew what Cyril Ramposa would do, it's... But most of the year has been dealing with this to try and get out facts amongst all the disinformation, the flood of disinformation. Proverbs 3 says, do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of the trouble from the wicked when it comes. The Lord will be your confidence. He'll keep your foot from being caught. We need to be interceding. We need to be informed. We need to be interceding. We need to be involved in practical action. We need to invest in workable solutions. We need to implement workable strategies for security and survival. A prudent man sees evil. We need to be prepared. We need to pray, publish, prepare, protest. We need to stand up and speak out and step out. We need to be armed and alert. We need to stock up supplies. Shortages are coming. We need backup plans. Secure your home and farm, your church and your mission. We need to prepare for lawlessness. It happened in Zimbabwe. Power failures, water mains being cut. We need to know our neighbors and help one another in community. There's strength in unity. Watch, stand fast in faith, be brave, be strong. We need to speak out on community radio stations, phone and programs, write letters and articles to your local community newspapers, and contribute to or set up webs or blogs or social media, Facebook pages that'll deal with these issues. We need to organize public meetings and screenings, perhaps of films like Agenda 2 and Bitter Harvest or Farmlands. Obtain the Security and Survival Handbook. I produced this through last year and published it earlier this year, not knowing where we were going, but knowing from what I've learned in our mission, the need for us to understand the times and to know what we should do specifically, how to protect schools, churches, homes, farms, and so on, and personal when we travel, and so on. We need to rescue and redeem and restore and reform and revive. We need to help build community support structures, support civil defense and neighborhood watch organizations. We need to get networked. Work for decentralization. In the Cape, we've got a strong movement for independence. Many people want the Cape to become an independent country. I know the Sotlanders are just one of many practical hands-on groups. Find groups in the area that you can network with and for, for information for mutual support. Nehemiah 414 says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. To be honest, there's nothing the communist respects more than strength. There's nothing they despise more than weakness. So we need to know our history. We need to be prepared. Any questions or comments? I know I've said a lot of shocking things, disturbing things. Any questions, comments? 
complaints or criticisms? Any other Cs? We have a mic. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. I don't mind uh, critical feedback as well. Uh, any questions or comments? Well, we appreciate encouragement too. Yes. Which part of Congo are you from? I'm from Kinshasa. Okay, well, I've ministered around Lubumbashi and Katanga mainly. We've got um, a Congolese co-worker from Uvira up in the eastern part of, Zambia, uh, of Congo, very close to Burundi. So I have a fair idea of what happened in the Congo. In fact, I remember one of the first things that alerted me to the fact that the media is not reflective of reality. I don't know how many of you can remember the man from uncle. In the 1960s, the man from uncle was like very popular, big thing. And it was the United Nations were the good guys. And there was this Russian agent and this American agent. And they were working in the UN to keep the world safe for democracy. Well, that's what the film was. And, ah, man from uncle. So I had friends in my classroom at school in Bulawayo who came from the Congo, who had fled who said, oh, no, no, that's not true. He said, the UN are not the good guys. The United Nations came and bombed us in Katanga. Uh, Lubumbashi was then Elizabethville. They bombed us. They bombed our hospitals. They bombed our schools. They bombed our churches. They looted our homes. They stole everything from our families when we were fleeing to get across the border into northern Rhodesia. And I remember the first disconnect, thinking, the media is telling me the United Nations, the UN, are the good guys. But... The people on the ground say the other way, and in fact, in the Congo right now, the Congo is the site of the largest United Nations peacekeeping operation in the world right now. And the UN are in, again, scandals of rape, abuse for some of the most vulnerable people, corruption. Everywhere the UN's gone that I've met them, Sudan, Rwanda, Angola, Yugoslavia, the UN have been the problem, not the solution. And do you know why? They're secular humanists. As one person said in Sudan, it's not that the United Nations is against religion. They're just against Christianity. Yeah. I've had the United Nations saying to me, when I've been trying to take Bibles into Sudan, you take off with Bibles, we will blow you out of the sky. Yeah. I've had my life threatened by UN officials for taking Bibles into Sudan. I've heard from Sudanese that they were wounded, they have been carried to a Red Cross evacuation after being bombed by the Sudanese, and so they've got fragments of shrapnel legs. And the UN official would not allow the man onto the plane until he took his cross. He had a wooden cross around his neck on leather thong. Off, we can't have a cross on a UN aircraft. This man's lying there bleeding, needing emergency treatment. So I said, did he take the cross off? And I said, they won't take the cross off for the Sudanese Muslims who want to kill him. You think they're going to take it off for the UN to get a flight? So no, he's left on the airstrip. The hostility of the United Nations to Christianity is basically, now you must know, I've been a missionary for over 38 years and my life has been dedicated to Africa. So you misunderstand me. This wasn't my concern for the white people. My concern is for all the people of Africa. 
everyone's going to suffer by the targeting. Just like the targeting of the Tutsi tribe in Rwanda didn't just hurt the Tutsi, it hurts everybody in all of Africa. You can't have one part of the body affected without all of it being affected. But also, bear in mind, just like the people in Zimbabwe are so malicious about the white commercial farmers, but they provided employment and housing, not to mention food, for millions who suffered. So yes, those white farmers suffered, but the black Zimbabweans suffered more, actually, a lot more. And my friends in Madhubi land were butchered and thrown down mine shafts, mass graves and so on, by the Zimbabwe government. So um, don't think to me, as a Christian, race isn't my concern. But the fact that the government's been targeting white people, I have to be speaking in those terms. Just like in Rwanda, I wouldn't have differentiated between serving a Tutsi or Hutu, but because the government made a big thing about the Tutsi, I have to mention it because that's their terminology. They've set the terms of debate. So I would not be talking in terms of race if it wasn't that that's the battle the government set. You understand? But your people in the Congo have been looted and abused so much. Do you know when Mobutu Sesiseku was president, an interviewer said, Mr. President, how is it possible that you've got the sixth poorest country in the world and you the fifth richest man in the world? He said, I'm the fourth richest man in the world. This is the kind of thing that goes on. So, any other comments or questions? Um, Mr. Henry, just a question. Uh, because I think South African politics, you tend to see um, a pattern where you know the communist, almost a uh, socialist communist agenda that comes through. And um, I see this, um, I think two weeks ago, um, General Becky Clinton uh, proposed uh, working on a draft amendment to the South African Environment Law, uh, whereby he is taking away self-defense as a reason to own firearm. This will probably see daylight in the next week or two. Yes. Um, what would you advise, I mean, a uh, South African white or black, because I don't think we're all living in the same country, we're all, you know, we're all going to suffer or prosper together. And exactly. What, what, what would you advise a South African at this point? Because the problem is that, you know, Coming to a point now where the ANC is clearly, uh, I mean, there's, there's been, and there's, there's you know, I don't want to go too far into it, but you know, the, 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 a lot of the backing has been pointed to, uh, you know, going through South Africa, funded by George Soros. You know, there's international sort of uh, um, influence in the situation. And interference would be a better term, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but, but, you know, like, basically, once you can the population, you're sitting in the same position as every other communist country where the government can exert its will in you. What, what would you advise a South African in this position to do at this point? Resistance. We need to be informed, we need to be involved, we need to be interceding, we need to be in every way resisting, and we've got a lot of options. For example, a lot of people, well, praise God for social media. The Trump revolution, whether you like Trump or not, he got elected in spite of the mass media, in spite of everything against them, by using social media. The mainstream is now the lamestream. In the past, you couldn't bypass the Oppenheimer, the beers controlled newspapers and TV in the country. But now you can through social media. Brexit in Britain was social media. All the media in Britain, from the Bolshevik Broadcasting Corporation onwards, they all opposed Brexit. The people voted for Brexit despite what the government and every political party in parliament and uh, their media were telling them to do. Same thing in, in the United States now, that, that the vast majority of people that got galvanized, do you know how Trump got elected? Not just by social media, he appealed to people who hadn't voted in years or never voted or hadn't voted for decades. And I was just in the States and I was speaking to people who said, I haven't voted since Ronald Reagan was president. And the amount of people, but he voted for Trump. The amount of people I've come across who were so disenchanted by politics, all politicians are corrupt, they're dishonest, it's a waste of time, whatever we do, everything keeps getting worse, and a lot of people are so disenchanted. Here's a statistical fact. It's true for America, it's true for Britain, it's true for South Africa. 
most of the people eligible to vote don't bother to register to vote or don't vote. In other words, more people don't vote than vote. And when you ask the people why they don't vote or don't register to vote, you know their answer? What difference could I make? More people don't vote than vote, and they say, what difference would it make? Well, if the silent majority would actually get involved, get registered, and get out there and vote their values, it would make a huge difference. So, as a Christian, as a Bible-believing, pro-life Christian, I am horrified and shocked that statistically, only 220,000 South Africans voted for pro-life, pro-family Christian parties in the last election. That means you can have five times more people at an Angus Buchan It Is Time prayer meeting that actually vote pro-life. Sure. Most South African Christians either don't vote or are voting for pro-abortion, homosexual marriage, gay GB, pink in position, communist, socialist, land invasions, and all the rest type policies. This is insane. And so I know we have millions of Christians in South Africa. Angus Buchan's proven that. But they don't vote. Or they don't vote their values. Or even worse, they vote for some corrupt criminals who make this country worse. If we could just get the people who attend an Angus Buchan conference to damn well get out there and vote for a Christian party, how difficult is it to know the ANC's pro-abortion the PSC's pro-abortion, the DA's pro-abortion, COPE's pro-abortion, EFF's pro-abortion. You've only got two political parties in Parliament that are pro-life. The Freedom Front Plus and the ACDP. That's it. If you think babies shouldn't be murdered with your taxpayers' money, it should be a no-brainer to know who we, at least who we don't vote for. Now, you do have you have got some other options. Uh, there are some smaller parties like Christian Democratic Party too that are pro-life, of course. Uh, but in Parliament, we've got only two parties that are pro-life. Now, we've got elections coming up next year. May, probably. If we, and your last chance to register the vote is 31st of January. If we can mobilize Christians to be salt and light, responsible Christians who have a say, because you know, I've heard it before, if you don't vote, you've got no right to complain about the political situation. Now, obviously, we want to do more than vote, but we should do nothing less than vote. We should be praying, working, informing, training. To me, some of the most important things we can do, I mean, well, let, let me just say in my life, I'm 58 years old, I'm a father of four children, I've got two grandchildren, and by the way, all my children, my grandchildren, son-in-law, all live in a home. And many people are surprised, how do you do that? I mean, our children are living in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and so on. How do you... Well, my children believe in this country, believe in the future. We believe in God's call here. We have called here. We, we love South Africa. We love Africa. We committed. And so even my daughter and grandchildren are here um, and, and all involved in our mission and, and dedicated. Now, the best thing my wife and I ever chose to do no TV. We have video, we choose some videos, we do not watch SATV, we do not watch Mnet, we do not watch the BBC. In fact, if I want to know what's going on in the world, I'll check Russia TV before I check BBC or CNN. Yes, they're a bunch of pathological liars. It's pretty bad. Most of my life the Russians have been the enemy. Now the Russians look more Christian than our people, uh, which is really weird, but hard for me to adapt to. The second best decision I made with my wife. Homeschooling. We home educate our children. Now, we've tried government school, we've tried independent Christian schools, and we've done home education. Our youngest is now doing his matric uh, home education. So, I must say, of all the things I've done, good and bad, the two very, 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 very best things, disconnect from the world's media, don't let them brainwash you. That's how I managed to have an independent uh, politically incorrect mind, and, and my children are walking with the Lord, none of them have ever left the faith, none of them have ever 
depart from the Lord. We haven't had a problem with teenage rebellion and all that because they've been home educated. And my children aren't sheltered from the world. My children have gone with me in a field. They've met cabinet ministers in Zambia. They've got many Zulu friends. They've been to every battle site around Africa. We've climbed Mount Majuba together. We've been to all at Ungungungluvo, uh, Dinganstadt, Olundi. My children know they've got their schooling on the road. Of course, for missionary, it's a little easier, I guess. Uh, but they've been involved in every outreach, every camp, every um, activity we're involved in, women's day outreaches, in the townships, wherever it is. And so my children aren't sheltered. Every one of my children could explain communism, Islam, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, secular humanism, all that sort of thing. They understand it. They haven't been sheltered. They, understand. they could give you the evolutionary arguments and demolish them. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm convinced that the single best thing parents can do is protect their children from satanic altar television and um, the indoctrination gulags that they call state schools. Those are the very best things I've found. Um, of course, then there's alternative media. I've spent a lifetime producing books like these and newsletters like those uh, in order to give alternatives, what we learned in the field and so on. So we can do a lot on the information battle We've got to be informed, mobilizing, getting involved. But families, congregations, communities, we can make a huge difference. If the people of this side of, of this country wake up, shake up, we've got what? Six months till the elections? That's a lot of time. It's not too much. There's no time to waste. But I've, I think this is a matter of, we like Zimbabwe was in the year 2000. You're at the brink. Yeah. We are either going to go off the edge of the cliff or we're going to take a turn to positive and so on. And it's not enough just to have a prayer meeting. Prayer meetings are important, but that's not an alternative to action. It's a foundation for action. What I don't like is people who go to a prayer meeting and then think, ah, right, now, what's on the news? Um, what we need is the people to go from there into evangelism, discipleship, and transforming the society. But I've, I have hope, many hopes. And I could give you a lot of hope. For example, I spoke with uh, Prince Mangasutu Butalesi's personal assistant. Butalesi is a good friend, but um, I didn't get to see him. I was at a funeral earlier this week, uh, had a chance to speak uh, with his personal assistant, and said, is it true that Afro Forum and the Zulu King have made an alliance? And she said, it is true. Sure. Uh, the Zulu King has asked for help with their farming and has promised help to protect the farms of the Afrikaans people, the country. And so it's basically, the Zulu king has said, you touch the land and it's war. Now the Zulus are serious. And to be honest, the two most militant, military experienced peoples in the continent of Africa would be the Zulu and the Afrikaner. And so any idiot who wants to take them on is taking a path to suicide, actually. If we wake up and shake up our people, I think, I've been as I've ministered around the world this year, from Australia to America, I've met people who are not even South Africans, who said, if you need us, we're there. The uh, moment it gets to being a shooting war, I'm talking about military veterans who've got piles of wars behind them, who will be here in a shot if KwaZulu declares independence, or the Cape declares independence, or the Transvaal, or if whatever's done to uh, try and break away from this insane national suicide, uh, there's many, many tens of thousands of South Africans as military advisors worldwide who would come back, and they've got tens of thousands of other friends who would also come back with their skills and come here and help. So make no mistake, uh, this government's heading towards one serious punch-up, and, and they would not come out of it very well because they're good at getting drunk and they're good at stealing and they're good at rioting, but they're not good at fighting. They cannot win a civil war. All they can win is corruption and maybe some corrupt elections. But if it, if it came to a shooting war, they would not be coming out of it very well. So, and I say that as somebody who's worked in war zones for the last four decades. So, any other comments, questions? Yes.
Yes, your question, comment, or complaint. Uh, sorry, Ms. Paul. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig, and my my question is to Peter. Um, so, Peter, you've been you've been sharing on on your experiences, and you have had vast experiences in Africa, and in, in in world situations, and all this. And, and and I speak on behalf of a lot of young people that I, that I've spoken about on different subjects, such as you've raised now. And it, it almost paints a very debilitating, a very um, daunting picture of, of the future and, and current affairs and 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 the, the state of affairs. And my only question is this: really, um, you know, from from the presentation, it it it, it seems it's this intrinsic. Um, system of governance and, and the banking system that's uh, working against the people. How do we extricate ourselves from um, the government and uh, the, the system in, and, and, and positively build a future that is not reliant on these people? Excellent question. Just the kind of question one wants. Thank you. How do we get out of it? How do we rebuild? Well, that's the whole vision of Reformation. Now, 500 years ago, literally 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg and called the people back to the Bible. And he, he was going against the entire world system, the entire political, ecclesiastical, economic system of the Middle Ages. He was saying, back to the Bible. This is unbiblical, this is wrong, and so on. And of course, it wasn't easy. But starting with a personal relationship with God, peace with God. Martin Luther wasn't trying to start a reformation. Martin Luther was trying to get peace with God. He was trying to get right with God. He wanted to know his sins were forgiven. And because he sought first the kingdom of God, a lot of other things were added. The scripture makes clear, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Which is very different from today where it is seeking first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. You see the difference in emphasis. Today the emphasis is all these things. Where the emphasis in the Bible is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. We need to keep our focus first. Love God. Fear God. Fear God alone. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do to others you want to be done unto. Make disciples of all nations. Teach obedience to all things the Lord has commanded. Be salt. Be light. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And so what we are seeing in the scriptures, if we can get first things first, other things will follow. Now, by starting with our relationship with God and making sure we are right with God, and that's the first highest priority. Nothing else is going to happen well until we are right with God. We must do personal repentance, restitution, everything that we need to do to make sure we're right with God and with our neighbor and our family. And let's face it, family is the hardest mission field of all. I was the youngest in my family and uh, I was the first to get converted. And you can imagine the rest of my family was not impressed with the youngest baby brother, religious fanatic, Jesus freak, uh, giving everyone Bibles for Christmas and things like this and, you know, them rolling the eyes. Um, but every member of my family did get converted. It took time. It wasn't easy. Even my father, even my mom, they, they were hard cases, but they all came to the Lord in time. And, of course, you start with your family, self, church, but you build out from there. Now, I've been, an, I've been a Christian now for 41 years. I was converted in 1977. The night I was converted, I was called to missions. To me... You know, you may think, why is this missionary speaking about these things? Well, first of all, you must understand, I lived through the revolution in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. I lived through the Southwest Africa Angola War. And what's gone on in South Africa? First stage of the revolution, now entering second phase of the revolution. I've ministered all throughout Eastern Europe, from Poland all the way down to Albania throughout Eastern Europe. I've got a lot of Russian and Ukrainian friends lived through everything that's been going on in Sudan, even before the independence, since 95, I've been working in South Sudan and in Northern Sudan. So Nigeria, Congo, all these places, I know their wars, I know their situations. 
So I can't, in good conscience, as a Christian and a missionary, keep quiet. When I see us following in the footsteps of failure and going down a disastrous path, I have to speak. Now, obviously, I would much prefer doing Bible teaching. In fact, right now, I'm working on preaching through the whole Bible. It's been a five-year project. I'm up to 2 Peter. Next Sunday, I preach on 1 John. We're hoping to finish Revelation by the end of the year and have this book, New Testament Survey, out by the, by the beginning of next year. Because January marks the 500th anniversary of expository preaching. Ulrich Zwingli began the Swiss Reformation, 1st of January, 1519, in Grossminster, in Zurich, Matthew 1, verse 1. He preached line by line, verse by verse, through every book in the New Testament. Now, that was the beginning of the Swiss Reformation. So to me, getting us back to the Bible is the most important Amen. foundation. That's the rock foundation. Amen. I think this church is called Petrus. I mean, you know about Amen. rock foundation. Absolutely. Built on the rock, the winds will come. The storms will rage, the floods will rise, but if a house is built on a rock, it'll stand. If we built in a, on the sand, it'll fall, but we built on the rock. So I finished the Old Testament survey a couple of years ago, praise God. We work on New Testament survey. There's things like this that we're trying to, that, that's where my heart is, missions in the Bible. But our country, South Africa, is not just important economically. It's important as a missionary sending base. I am concerned for South Africa primarily, not just because this is the home for my children, my grandchildren, but because this is the missionary sending base that blesses and equips and supports so much of the church in Africa. I do not want to see the aid that's been flowing generously from South Africa through Zimbabwe, Zambia, up to Congo and Sudan end. We don't want that curtailed. So, so to me, the first and foremost priority would be repentance. Reformation, revival, restoration of biblical principles. You can go through a whole lot of, lot of R's. There's a lot of things we can do and must do. So it's semper reformata. Always reforming. The church having been reformed must still be reformed. Um, semper reformata, reformanda est. Church having been reformed must continually be reformed. So, sadly, why is our country in this mess? I've spoken about a whole bunch of symptoms. ANC is visibly the government, and the EFF is visibly the source of this insane national suicide. But, to be fair, we get the governments we deserve. Yeah. 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 Why does evil increase? Because good people do nothing. I would more blame us as Christians in South Africa, then I would blame the pagan, atheist, communist creeps who are looting and destroying this country. If we were doing our job, interceding, evangelizing, discipling, if we were really having our children brought up in the faith, and if our churches were actually more concerned about God's glory and honor and God's word than numbers, money, success, and all the other things, popularity, people-pleasing. The church, if the church was doing its job, the country wouldn't be in a mess it's in. I'm convinced. And that's one of my messages in Zimbabwe, that I haven't, does, I feel for the Zimbabwe people, we love them, but I haven't seen the people in Zimbabwe come to repentance and recognize that they in any way contributed to the mess in Zimbabwe by standing by and doing nothing while the Madibili were massacred. Yeah. Standing by and doing nothing while the farms are stolen. Oh, well, it's not ours. But when their jobs were affected, when they were starving, then suddenly they start to be concerned. Where's the sense of personal responsibility? And as Christians, we should always be responsible. So I am deeply concerned because I remember when we started our transformation movement in 19, no, 2001. 2001 in Cape Town, that's where it started. Graham Power, transformation, filled Newland Stadium, rugby stadium, 55,000 people. And it was exhilarating. It was great. It was wonderful. But I was deeply disturbed. Yes, there was prayer dances. There was lots of waving of hands, clapping, singing. There was a lot of enthusiasm. But at no point was there any preaching against sin. No point was there the reading of the law. At no point was there even a reciting of the Apostles' Creed or reminding of the Great Commission. There was so much of us. We must get blessed. And I went to Grandpa and I said, I think this is wrong. 
Statistically, most of the people in the stadium aren't right with God. Statistically, most of the people there are stealing from the workplace, are lying, are involved in adultery, pornography. And, I mean, statistically, this is reality. You cannot have a several-hour prayer meeting in a stadium without first challenging people to get right with God and emphasizing repentance. We've got to start somewhere. And I encourage it, but you know, they just carried on with this lights and noise and it, it's because people feel good. That's not good enough. It's like a doctor who ignores the disease is not helping the patient. That's why we start our evangelism like where the master teaches with the law of God because would you consider yourself to be a good person? Virtually everybody I meet on the streets answers, yes. I'm a very good person. And that's the problem. I mean, the amount of people in our churches like that. So the average South African might see themselves as a victim of circumstances, but very few see themselves as contributing or responsible for the general spiritual moral decay. We've lost a sense of loyalty to God and family and friends and neighbors and workplace and churches. The amount of people, for example, as a missionary, I have people trying to join my mission. And one of the first questions you ask is, where are you a church member? Oh, well, I sometimes go here and I sometimes go there. Well, where are you a member? Uh, what do you mean? Member? You know, accountability, commitment, oversight. Huh? I've spoke to George Verver, head of Operation Mobilization, one of the biggest missions in the world, about this. says, you know, Peter, most of the missionaries in the world today aren't members of a church. What? When I tried to join my first mission, Hospital Christian Fellowship, the most important thing was, not just was a member of the church, but did the church endorse me and recommend and send me? Now, missions are taking in people who are not even committed to a church. Wild geese member migration. All over the place. How on earth can we put down roots and produce fruit if we're rolling stones? If we're not rooted and built solidly into a community where we're accountable, where we're answerable, where we're being mentored and discipled. No wonder our Christianity in this country is so shallow. Because actually, do you know, church attendance in this country is pretty shocking. When I got converted, this is a Cape Town statistic, when I got converted, the average church member attended three meetings a week. Today, the average church member attends one to two meetings a month. That's in Cape Town. I don't know if you're that bad, but, but it's, it's got serious. Commitment is now, people are shallow and sh short term. It's the quality of the Christian faith in South Africa and Zimbabwe that has led to the plight we're in. Our people are self-serving, self-excusing, self-congratulatory, patting themselves on the back. And many of the ministers have learned from the congregation don't do anything controversial. Yeah. You could be called legalistic. Uh, don't speak about heresy or rebuke things. You could be called divisive. You mustn't speak out against homosexuality perversion. Then you could be intolerant. And it carries on. We've got to be politically correct, tolerant, low-key. We've got to be non-judgmental. And we're more concerned about pleasing people now than pleasing God. And so, to me, that's the real problem. So if we could Get back to the old time religion, Amen. back to the Bible. I believe that's the single biggest thing that's going to save this country. Amen. Good. I think it's time for tea time. Let me hand Great. over. So, guys, we've got a half an hour from now till uh, 11.30 tea time. So, basically, for those...